I deeply regret that I can't be with you today at this symposium on John Chilembwe. I would love to be with you, but I am twice as old as Chilembwe was when he was shot, escaping into Portuguese East Africa, and I am several times more ill than he was at that time. But I will do my best to offer you a point of view on Chilembwe and one or two points about him which you might want to include in your deliberations. When the rising, or some people called it rebellion, took place January, February 1915, it was called the Nyasaland Native Rising. When Tom Price and I wrote Independent African, we called the subtitle the Nyasaland Native Rising. In the 50 or 60 years which have passed since then, the term Nyasaland Native Rising has disappeared and it's called more and more the Chilembwe Rising. Now, I don't altogether understand why this should be so, but it does indicate that people who use that expression do not seem to recognise that there were other leading African intellectuals, proto-nationalists if you want to call them that, from Nyasaland, who were with Chilembwe in the plotting of the Rising and in the conduct of it. And he may have been the leading figure in it because he brought back from America so much prestige. But nevertheless, there were others in the Rising. And one of the urgent tasks for research and writing, it seems to me, is to look at some of his colleagues. Now we've got a fair amount of information on John Gray Cooper Mapanta. There's probably enough to write a short biography of him. But there are others who are probably equally important. I think of the ex-KR man David Kaduya. There is no even short biographical sketch of him. There's no biographical sketches of people like Filippo Chinyama, who led the rising which went off half cock at Ncheu, and there are others. What I would like to see myself is a little less concentration on Shilembui and a little more on those who assisted him. But that is only my point of view. The thing that I find more and more interesting as time goes on is the neglect by so many students of Chilembwe of Joseph Booth's daughter's little book. I refer to Emily Booth Langworthy's little book, to which I wrote an introduction many years ago, called This Africa Was Mine. She had been the little girl who was looked after with her brother by Joseph Booth when he first went to Africa and she never forgot John Chilembwe but she did not hear of the rising until I began to write about it and later Tom Price and I began to write about it together. So in her book she refers to John and she means John Chilembwe. In that book, he is a peaceful, quiet, well-behaved man. Her father put into the character of Chilembwe, as far as I can see, a great deal of his own pacifism. And John Chilembwe, therefore, grew up, teenage and onwards, in a milieu of pacifism. But he goes to America, not far from where Nat Turner's rising took place in Lynchburg, Virginia, and that, in my opinion, seems to have whetted his understanding, his appetite, if you want to put it that way, 
for the use of violence in Africa. But it does seem to me that there is a contradiction or coexistence between his early pacifism and his later support for violence. What we do know about him, however, is that as a young man, he could shoot a gun. We know he regularly shot elephants, even when he was back at the PIM. There is a mixture, seems to me, yet unresolved by those who studied him, of pacifism, peacefulness, and the use of weapons for violence and other means. I also do feel, as I've said before, that we should have more information and concentration on some of Chilembwe's supporters. I, at the moment, find what attracts me most about him is the remarkable document he produced not long after the First World War broke out in 1914 in the form of a letter called John T. Chilembwe on behalf of his countrymen which he sent to the Nyasaland Times to be published there. They published it. A few copies went out and a few people got copies of the letter and then the government discovered what he'd said and they cut it out of all future issues. So they had thereby closed any avenues of discussion with Chilembwe about African grievances. It is a most remarkable document and it's one which in my opinion has gained and will gain increasing attention from all sorts of students of African nationalist movements and African reaction movements against European dominance in the future. My old student who did a book of documents whose name at the moment I cannot remember alas, he was a Gambian diplomat, put Chilembwe's letter in a prominent place in his book of documents. And I think we should look more and more at that than we do. But what we must also, it seems to me, look at are the contradictions in his character between a peaceful approach, signified by all sorts of people, and then his use of guns, and there seems to me to be so much more that can be found out about him if we will concentrate not only on his own personal figure in life but the milieu around him. There is also, I am quite convinced, a great deal more material on John Chilembwe in the United States, particularly in Virginia, Lynchburg, Virginia, than has hitherto been used. When we, Thomas Price and I wrote Independent African, we used some of his letters to the Afro-American body which supported him, the National Baptist Convention. But all of them, which were published in that convention's journal, the Missionary Herald, have yet to be catalogued and commented on, and much more can be found out from Chilembwe about that. I wish I could stay for the conference, the seminar, but alas I can't. But I shall be with you in spirit, if not in person. Goodbye and good luck.